What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today, I'm super excited because we are talking about a really novel compound that I was really interested in many, many years ago, and I actually started experimenting with it uh, to improve my athletic performance, to act as a natural sunscreen. And so today, I'm in the studio with Dave Wachumol. Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. So maybe Dave, let my audience know a little bit about what we're what we're talking about here today. We're talking about astaxanthin. So maybe did you want to, you know, let my listeners know a little bit about your journey? Like, how did you get so fascinated into understanding uh, what astaxanthin actually is? Yeah, astaxanthin is a naturally occurring molecule that's prevalent in the marine environment. And my journey started about 25 years ago on the big island of Hawaii as a summer job in high school for me. And there was a company over there that had these ponds that were dug out of the lava fields and they would grow a particular form of microalgae that produces this compound called astaxanthin as a defense mechanism against UV light from the sun. And this algae is then um, consumed um, up the food chain and it's what makes salmon pink and crustaceans uh, red and, and it works its way um, all the way up even up into whales. Um, and so this, this super nutrient, if you will, uh, has these really important roles beyond just being a pigment. It has uh, health and, and vitality uh, benefits. And so I kind of stumbled across it um, you know, 25 years ago and was working in the production of it in, in the algae ponds. Um, but then um, we started looking more into the science of astaxanthin. And at the time, there was only a few hundred peer-reviewed papers, uh, but there were uh, some safety studies uh, supporting um, it, its use and intriguing hints looking at its uh, role as an antioxidant and an anti-inflammatory um, and actually no human studies at the time. Um, but we knew that there was a lot of promise since we pursued it. And over the years since, there's been now more than 3,000 peer-reviewed papers, um, 100 human clinical studies, and a, a much deeper understanding of, of how it works. And so it's been an incredible journey. And it's cool because the whole international research community is contributing. Uh, there's people researching it all over the world. So uh, every day there, there's new research coming out and we've contributed a lot, but it's also great to be a part of that whole group that's really advancing the understanding of this amazing molecule that nature has come up with to deal with a lot of environmental stresses and, and things that can help our uh, health and longevity. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really incredible to see just the, um, the plethora of, of research that's expanded you know, looking at astaxanthin, I mean, back in the day when I was first looking it up, it was oftentimes just touted as just an antioxidant. But we know, both you and I know that it does so much more than that. Um, so maybe let's get into, I mean, you sort of mentioned, you know, it's found in, you know, algae and it's, you know, um, it's what makes salmon pink. Uh, did you want to sort of talk about the evolution of supplementation, maybe sort of talk about, I mean, when they first launched astaxanthin in supplement form, were they using lower dosages? What did that typically look like? Yeah, so right when I was starting to work um, in, in the production of the algae, at the time there were no supplements on the market. And the company I was with um, was looking at actually producing it for the aquatic feed business. Um, so for um, the, 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 salmon you know farming organizations that are raising uh you know farm raised salmon and and they need to feed the salmon astaxanthin in order for them to not only be pink but also to help uh, their health and development and um but it turns out that um you know a, a really interesting market was would actually be bringing it directly to humans and so our company and, and also a company that was literally across the street from us um there in kona um, both brought the first um, astaxanthin supplements to market back in 1999 and 2000. Um, and at the time, um, just producing the astaxanthin, extracting, purifying, getting it into capsule form was a big feat. And so the doses were quite low, a few milligrams uh, to start. Um, but that allowed people to start experimenting with it. The Ironman athletes who train a lot in Kona and do their, their uh, triathlon in, in Kona, um, you know, started utilizing it. Um, so this core niche community started to form around astaxanthin. Um, we and others um, advanced research uh, in the space. Um, and then over time, the, pr the production uh, improved and 
um, the understanding and the use of Vastacent at different doses um, increase. And so um, over the course of the next decade or so, the dose worked its way up to say around 12 milligrams per capsule as the production yields uh, improved and um, the science advanced, people understood that, okay, higher dosing uh, was correlated with improved health benefits as well. Yeah, because back in the day, I mean, I remember when I was like, I sort of worked in a supplement store, like a health food store in, in uh, locally. And I remember the, the the initial capsules that were being sold were like four milligram um, mm -hmm. capsules. And I remember like researching, Ooh, well, what, what would happen if I combined this astaxanthin with my fish oil that I was already taking? And I'm like, hang on a second. That's literally like what krill oil is. But um, mm -hmm. I want to, I, I really want to get stuck into, I guess, like it's, um, biological impact, like how it affects human physiology. Um, and specifically, let's start off with what it's really well known for, which is its antioxidant potential. Um, mm -hmm. Did you want to sort of outline, you know, how it, how it exerts its antioxidant effect and how it compares to like vitamin C, vitamin E and other anti other antioxidants? Yeah, of course. And, and actually before that, I'll just uh, touch on your prior point about the krill oil and the fish oil. Um, so, uh, with salmon, you'll get omega threes, you'll get astaxanthin. So a lot of the benefits that you would get from fish oils, uh, krill oil, astaxanthin. Um, some people ask if, if you can take, you know, astaxanthin instead of an omega three supplement. And I think that, you know, they do different things are great complements in terms of say with the omega threes, you can help to replenish the lipids in your cellular membranes. And with astaxanthin, it can help to protect those lipids from oxidation. Um, so they're really um, good in in complement um, in combination. Um, and one point regarding krill oil specifically, because it does contain small amounts of astaxanthin, because astaxanthin is is part of uh, is uh, works its way up into the krill, is that the amount of astaxanthin that you'll get in krill oil is pretty small. It'll be microgram um, amounts, so less than a gram. And so while you are getting astaxanthin in your krill oil you're not getting anywhere near the amount that you'd get in a single ingredient astaxanthin supplement. Um, even like the four milligram doses that were initially on the market would be um, significantly more than you get in a krill oil supplement. And now when you have 12 milligram capsules um, and, and you have higher bioavailability formulations like ours, um, it's orders of magnitude difference. But in any case, you know, fish oils, krill oils, obviously great you know benefits that have been demonstrated. And we think astaxanthin is, is great. Uh, complement uh, to that. And then positioning to the mechanism of action, astaxanthin is really interesting when you look at its chemical structure. Uh, and so the, the way that the uh, structure is designed, it's the, the perfect link to span cellular membranes. Um, but beyond just the, the length of, of the molecule, it's also the polarity. And so the the end ring groups on the astaxanthin molecule have hydroxyl groups and ketone groups that um, give the molecule polarity. And that allows it to span and anchor across cellular membranes, um, which have polar head groups um, on, on either end of uh, either side of the membrane. And so that allows astaxanthin to anchor into the cellular membranes without disrupting the membrane. Um, and so it's perfectly situated in these cellular membranes to fight off oxidative stress, you know, free radicals, um, but it does so um, without disrupting the lipids in the membrane, which if you say, look at beta carotene or vitamin E, they may get into a cellular membrane, um, but they don't have the same uh, chemical structure or polarity, like in the case of beta, uh, beta carotene. Uh, to anchor across the membrane and so it can disrupt the lipids in your cellular membrane, which um, can actually have negative effects. Um, and so we've done um, studies, for example, looking at a model membrane and showing how astaxanthin does not disturb the membrane and other well-known antioxidants like beta carotene or um, you know, vitamin E are, are actually having that kind of counterproductive effect. And then when you also look at things like lipid peroxidation or oxidation of the lipids in the membranes, you have a significant benefits with astaxanthin because it can fight off those free radicals both inside and outside the membrane. And, and what's also especially interesting about astaxanthin is that um, you, you have the lipid bilayers, the membranes of the cell, um, both the outer plasma uh, membrane of the cell, but you also have membranes around the nucleus and the mitochondria and other 
uh, cellular components. Um, and astaxanthin can get into all these locations and, and fight off oxidative stress um, in each of these locations. And so it really has an impact on the oxidation of lipids and proteins and DNA. Um, and it does so with great potency. Um, and it's been de demonstrated in several studies to have much better, um, you know, free radical or a single oxygen scavenging types of uh, benefits, for example, compared to other antioxidants. So it's much more potent. It gets to the, all the appropriate locations and it spans those membranes in ways that's very unique. So it's, it's a very special antioxidant. And so to characterize it as just another antioxidant would definitely be uh, a mistake because it's, it's very different than a lot of the other well-known antioxidants. Yeah. And in addition to that, Dave, what about in terms of its, um, its half-life or sort of how long it appears to last in the human body? Do we have any um, data on that at all? Yeah, we've done uh, human clinical studies and uh, we demonstrated, and this is consistent with um, other, other studies and, and extrapolations from, from animal studies as well. But so in, in humans, uh, it has about a 24 hour half-life, meaning that after you take the dose, um, you'll absorb it. Um, and we found maximum concentrations um, in that probably six to nine hour uh, time frame. I want to say nine hours probably. And, um, and then over the course of 24 hours, um, you'll, you'll get down to half of, of the uh, concentration. And, and so from a uh, pharmacokinetic standpoint, uh, 24 hour half-life or so is conducive for daily dosing. Um, whereas if something had a much shorter half-life, you have to take it multiple times throughout the day to make sure that you don't deplete the levels in your system too quickly. Um, and so in, with astaxanthin, you can take it once a day, you can take it twice a day. Uh, the main thing is you need to take it with a meal because it's lipophilic or fat soluble, um, which is how uh, other carotenoids are as well. Um, and so when you are ingesting astaxanthin, if you also have been consuming a meal with some fats in there, then your GI is um, you know, doing the things that are needed to process the fats and incorporate those into your body. And then with that, astaxanthin will come along uh, for the ride and, and get into the body. And what's especially interesting as well is that it gets to your liver and it gets packaged into lipoproteins like LDL, HDL, VLDL. And it not only prevents those uh, lipoproteins from oxidation, and we've shown in clinical uh, studies that you can reduce um, oxidized LDL, uh, but it uses those to get around the body and get to the heart, get to the brain, um, and then it's transferred into the, the cells uh, at those sites. Um, so, so astaxanthin is systemically distributed to all the major organs, gets into the cells, fights off um, free radicals, oxidative stress, and then this has a host of downstream effects on important cellular pathways, inflammatory pathways, uh, and others um, that leads to a variety of benefits, uh, depending on if you're looking at the heart or the joints or the brain or the muscles, um, the liver, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so that's essentially how it works. And yeah, once daily oral dosing um, is, is a perfect regimen. Yeah, no, you've explained that so, so well. Um, in terms of what I'm, what I'm curious to know about, and this might be really interesting for the listeners, is a lot of these antioxidants, Dave, like, for example, vitamin C, vitamin E, some of them, well, a lot of them actually have an ability to regenerate glutathione. Um, is there any data on how astaxanthin impacts the body's master antioxidant glutathione? Yeah, so, so astaxanthin definitely is a supportive of your endogenous antioxidant systems. Um, it has impacts on a variety of pathways, um, that uh, are supportive of antioxidant uh, activity. Um, so astaxanthin kind of has multi-factorial uh, antioxidant benefits from both its direct you know, scavenging and quenching of uh, free radicals, but also by bolstering your endogenous systems that over time uh, can be depleted you know, based on age or, or, or other factors as well. Hmm, awesome. And in terms of uh, like, I really would love to get deeper into sort of going back to the evolution of astaxanthin products on the market. Um, talk to us about how AX3, your particular astaxanthin, talk us through how your particular form is unique to other forms on the market. So like I mentioned earlier, I, I started in the production with the, the algae or the, the microalgae that produces astaxanthin. 
And in that process, you are growing the algae in these ponds, uh, or it could be done in, in tubes as well. Um, but in, in this case, um, we have we had open ponds uh, that were growing the microalgae, and the algae start out their life that they're 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 actually green algae, and then when the sunlight hits the algae, um, they they're stressed and they produce astaxanthin uh, in defense uh, to protect uh, against the UV light, and then the astaxanthin turns bright red, and and so in that process, the the algae is exposed to the elements, and so not only the sun. Um, but you have everything. You have the volcano nearby. So you have uh, Vog from the volcano. You have airplanes flying over because the, there's an airport nearby. Um, and you have uh, anything else just because it's it's prone to the elements. Um, and so there is a contamination risk um, with um, the open pond um, farming of the astaxanthin. Um, you also have uh, challenges with batch to batch consistency. Um, but even if you get that all correct and you get it lined up and you get your astaxanthin or you get your algae produced, or if you do it in a closed system like some other manufacturers do, uh, you still are then ending up with um, an extract of the microalgae that you're then you know, trying to um, you know, purify or get as much of the astaxanthin out of. Um, and even with the, the, the latest you know, techniques that were developed over the years, you're, you're only ending up with five or 10% astaxanthin in this microalgal extract. And then the rest is just other stuff from the algae, um, which is not necessarily bad for you, but it's not the active component that you're um, really after. Um, it also uses a lot of water and land and energy and resources. Um, so it's, it's somewhat environmentally uh, taxing to, to, you know, certainly to, to um, uh, scale the production if you're really trying to uh, ramp up uh, for, for larger markets. And so we actually pivoted away from that and uh, as part of exploring astaxanthin for pharmaceutical use, because it had these profound health benefits, we thought, well, maybe we could even look at this as a pharmaceutical agent that would go through uh, the clinical development uh, program and actually be approved uh, for use for particular indications. Um, we started to look at uh, improved methods of manufacturing. Because if you're going to take um, a naturally occurring substance through a drug development pathway, the, the US FDA would typically have issues with an extract from a plant or an algae because it's not always consistent and pure. And the FDA wants to know exactly what's in every capsule. It has to be very pure, very consistent, well characterized. And so we worked with manufacturers to actually do a laboratory based uh, production method called natural product total synthesis, where you're essentially building the molecule from scratch uh, using uh, advanced uh, synthesis techniques. Um, and so you are uh, producing the nature identical form of the molecule. So it's the exact same chemical structure. You can get the exact same isomer, either single isomer or a mixture of isomers, depending on which um, route of production you choose. Um, and with that though, you get uh, very high purity. You don't get any of the other stuff you would get from the algae and it's very um, consistent um, and you can have analytical methods to uh, characterize exactly, you know, what the uh, molecule is that you produced and, and that it's very pure and clean. Um, and then with that, we can formulate it um, to be really well absorbed in the body. Uh, and, and so we, we work on that. And uh, ultimately, after a decade or so of pharmaceutical development on manufacturing and safety studies and uh, other studies looking at efficacy in various areas, we ultimately um, brought those learnings back to the supplement market and, and launched a supplement form using um, what we call biopure astaxanthin or highly bioavailable pure astaxanthin produced by natural product total synthesis. And so we think of it as kind of the best of both worlds where you have that background in the, the pharmaceutical development, the rigor of that type of an approach, but with the uh, natural uh, substance um, that, that you're delivering uh, to the body that, that nature intended. So that's really how our form is distinguished from um, most of the other forms on the market that you'll find, which are extracted from algae that's produced one way or another. Yeah, phenomenal. And in terms of uh, storage for like the end consumer, uh, maybe it's worthwhile chatting about whether or not, because I've actually wanted to know this myself, whether or not it should be refrigerated or if it's okay to leave it in, in the pantry in a, in a dark, dark place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, for everyday consumer use, you can, you can have your, uh, your bottle, your pouch of the, the capsules sitting in your pantry, 
Um, yeah, just normal room temperature conditions is fine. There's been um, stability studies done showing that that's uh, sufficient. Um, for example, even accelerated stability studies at elevated temperatures, um, elevated humidity, that over the course of many months would only lead to a, a small amount of degradation. And so with a normal uh, application where you're gonna be uh, consuming a, a bottle or a pouch of, of the astaxanthin capsules over the course of a month or two, depending on your dosage, that there's definitely not gonna be any issues. If you were truly trying to store it as long as you possibly could and have it be good decades later, which we've actually you know, had say in our labs in the past um, samples of astaxanthin stored for years, decades almost, and and, um, and then going back and analyzing and showing that it's um, it, it's still very stable. Um, and in, even with our formulation, um, we've looked at um, the stability and, and modeled stability out um, many years. We, we, we determined a, uh, a shelf life of um, a median self, shelf life of potentially 50 years, even for the acetanthin formulation. Um, even just under normal, not even frozen conditions. But if you were to freeze it, it can be longer. And so, so astaxanthin itself is a very, um, you know, is, is sufficiently stable, especially in, in our formulation. Um, and um, it's not like a perishable dairy product or something that spoils, you know, if anything um, over time, you know, it, it will lose a small amount of potency, um, but it, it's not necessarily degrading in, into uh, something that is uh, spoiled uh, in any way. So for, for everyday purposes, and, you know, if you just take it and as long as you're not leaving it out, you know, on your driveway in the sun, you know, for months on end, I, I think you're going to be just fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost like the substance itself wants to be eternal so that humans, <laughs> humans can mm -hmm. live long, which, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and we actually do a couple of things where in the formulation, we throw in a little bit of vitamin C and vitamin E, so just small amounts, um, which are also antioxidants, but they're there as sacrificial antioxidants, um, just so that the astaxanthin does, it, you know, doesn't want to interact with the oxygen or moisture in the air. Um, and that way you can use up some of the vitamin C and vitamin E in the formulation, um, thereby protecting the astaxanthin to do its thing in the body. Um, so, so that also helps to give it just that added bit of, of shelf life as well. That's, uh, that's remarkable. We'll, we'll get into, um, later towards the end of the podcast, what we'll get into is like what you think it could stack really well with. We'll get into like synergistic nutrients. So I'm looking forward to that, but let's mm -hmm. sort of, um, let's sort of segue into the longevity research. Now this is going to be extremely exciting because I know, I know, I know I've got a, a number of people who are really enthusiastic about the anti-aging space and um, following Brian Johnson's protocols and they're really loving it all. So maybe do you want to sort of talk about that, Dave, how does astaxanthin potentially impact uh, longevity parameters? There's been a bunch of really cool research in this space. So um, preliminary work involves some of the typical model organisms that are used for basic research and longe longevity research. And so astaxanthin has demonstrated increased lifespan in the C. elegans worms uh, in multiple models. Um, and also some interesting insights into the mechanisms um, by which it extended lifespan in terms of knocking out a particular gene and then seeing if you still extended lifespan or not. And then thereby knowing that, oh, we probably act through this particular uh, gene um, so some key learnings there in the C. elegans. There was also increased lifespan demonstrated in fruit flies um, and yeast, also a commonly used model organisms. Um, there's been a lot of research looking at uh, longevity related um, pathways and, and mechanisms, um, you know, things like autophagy or cellular cleanup or cellular senescence or the so-called zombie cells um, or um, cell death with apoptosis. Um, and, you know, important uh, pathways related to aging. So there's been a lot of that mechanistic research. Um, and then uh, based on a study that we conducted with our collaborators at the University of Hawaii, we were able to show that our form of astaxanthin increased the expression of FOXO3, which is a really important anti-aging gene that is involved in a lot of things, but including reducing inflammation. Um, and we increased FOXO3 in the heart tissue of mice. Uh, and so that was a really exciting finding because there's been a lot of other work demonstrating that FOXO3 is, is really important um, with respect to longevity where um, 
to back up in, in humans, we all have the VOXO3 gene and there's different forms of the gene that are more active, if you will. And if you have the most active form of the gene, you're three times more likely to live to 100 healthy. Uh, whereas if you have the other less active forms, then you won't necessarily be uh, genetically as endowed um, and lucky to live as long. Um, and so it turns out that with astaxanthin, you can help to make those other forms of the FOXL3 gene more active, more like the genetically superior form. And so, uh, and doing, showing that we could do that in the mice, uh, in, in mammals was, uh, was a great, uh, finding. And so that led to the, the U.S. National Institutes of Health, uh, and specifically the National Institute on Aging, um, who has this, uh, they fund an interventions testing program that is conducted at, uh, three different uh, organizations in parallel at the University of Michigan, the U University of Texas, and the Jackson Lab in Maine. And this program has been conducted for the last 20 years. And each year they, they start a cohort of mice that are specific, specifically bred for this lifespan research program. And they have thousands of mice each year that are in the cohorts and they have identical living conditions and, and everything at each of the three sites. Um, but they um, will look at various agents that could be drugs, they could be supplements, they could be um, plant extracts, they could be anything um, that has promise, that has some science supporting a potential impact on longevity, specifically on lifespan. And this is the program that first showed that rapamycin um, has a profound impact on longevity and has since been repeated in this model multiple times. Uh, they've done different doses and combinations with other agents. And so this would probably be uh, widely considered to be the gold standard in mammalian lifespan research. And so this particular program, uh, our collaborators from the University of Hawaii um, proposed that we should be included, that our form of astaxanthin should be included in this program based on the research that, that they conducted together with the other preliminary data. And so the intervention testing program, the ITP agreed and said, yes, let's, let's test it. And so starting in 2019, we worked with ITP um, to come up with the right dose and uh, how to incorporate that into the, the feed or the chow uh, for the, the mice in this program. And then these mice were followed um, for several years, for the rest of their lives, basically. And so the mice were started in middle age at 12 months of age, which for the mice is the equivalent to being 40-ish in human years. Um, so they were started in their middle age and they were fed astaxanthin in their diet for the rest of their lives. And then there was a control group as well. And it turns out that um, the mice with the astaxanthin uh, in their child lived 12% longer, specifically the male mice lived 12% longer with very high statistical significance. And um, this was really exciting because in this 20 year history, there's only been five other agents that have extended lifespan in the model more than 10%. And, uh, and that includes things like rapamycin, but we were the first agent to have that more than 10% life extension that also is exceptionally safe, exceptionally well tolerated and broadly accessible as a supplement. Whereas things like rapamycin, um, do work really well as a lifespan extender, but you have safety tolerability issues that people are trying to work around and, and address. And so this was a really exciting finding. And then in the female mice, um, the control females already lived uh, longer than, than the males, like 9% like longer. And so um, with, with astaxanthin treatment, they, they lived a few percent longer, although not statistically significant. But when you compare both groups, the males and the females, they ended up both living a similar lifespan um, with, with the treatments, whereas before the females lived quite a bit longer. And so it, it somewhat allowed the males uh, to catch up. Um, so, so that was uh, some interesting findings. And now the, the ITP is actually going back and doing a follow-up study, looking at a different dose. They wanted to see what if we do a much lower dose, you know, would you still get the lifespan benefit or, or, or not? And they wanna try to see the window of how much you have to dose to have the potential benefit uh, it could also be interesting to look at higher doses and see, well, what if you could have a greater lifespan benefit? Um, and then also to look at related health span um, impacts, which they can do in, in separate uh, versions of, of their research program. So, so that's great to have that whole research underway. And it really complements um, the impacts that you see on other things that are important to aging that aren't necessarily lifespan, because you want to improve both lifespan and, of course, health, health span. And so things like 
uh, your cognitive health, your joint and muscle health, um, you know, et cetera, your skin health. And these are things that there's a lot of exciting science with astaxanthin. And so you really have that complement of potentially extending lifespan, which if you, if you take that 12% increase in this NIH funded ITP program, and you were to translate that to humans, that could be potentially like another nine or 10 years in, in humans. And so imagine if you could live another decade and live that decade with health, you know, that would be amazing. And so that's really what this potentially supports. And that's why we're so excited about this longevity research. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of, you mentioned um, what I want to sort of explore is like the safety toxicology data. You mentioned like rapamycin and some of these other GRO protective compounds. They do, do have some collateral damage, some other like, I guess, side effects that we don't want to incur. Um, in terms of safety data, do you want to sort of explore what, what does that look like, LD50 for, for astaxanthin, things like that? Yeah, so normally you'll, yeah, you'll have, um, you know, a lethal dose or you'll have a no adverse effect uh, level or a NOL that you'll, that you'll discover when you are uh, doing toxicology uh, research or studies with, with various agents. And, and in the case of astaxanthin, because astaxanthin was um, approved by the FDA for use as an additive in the aquatic feed for salmon uh, a few decades ago, um, it first had to undergo a series of toxicity studies before the FDA would permit its inclusion in the feed. And so the types of studies that were done there were quite analogous to what you would do for pharmaceutical development. Um, and so these were very high dose single dose toxicity studies where you would take thousands of milligrams of astaxanthin per kilogram of body weight of the animal, which for comparison, if we humans are taking a dose of 12 milligrams, um, you know, and, um, and that's total, you know, that's not uh, per milligram of body weight and humans may be 60, 70, 80 kilos, we're talking fractions of a milligram per kilogram. Um, and so you'd have to take, you know, say 70 milligrams, um, if you were a 70 kilo human to have one milligram per kilogram uh, of dosing. And these studies were thousands of milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So or orders of magnitude more than we humans are consuming in single dose. Then there was subchronic dosing, like three months of dosing at ex also very high levels. There was, um, long-term, uh, one, two year studies in um, in rodents, for example, which is a very long portion of their life, um, carcinogenicity studies, uh, showing no impacts. There were, um, uh, developmental and reproductive toxicity studies where you give it to mothers and, and look at, um, you know, reproduction and offspring showing no impacts. There's genotoxicity looking at, you know, impacts to DNA, for example, no issues there. Um, and so from a safety standpoint, these toxicity studies did not identify any toxic doses. Um, and the only finding that you may come across is in a female rat, um, there was a benign liver lesion that is um, not translatable clinically to humans. Um, and so that was the only thing. There was really nothing else from an actual tox standpoint to say, okay, well, yeah, this is the dose that it becomes toxic. If anything, it's just, you can't give the animal enough of it. You know, you only feed them, dose them so much. And, and so, um, you may get their, their fat tissue, the adipose tissue may be pigmented because of the accumulation of, of, of astaxanthin, you know, into their, into their tissues, for example, but, um, it doesn't appear to have those high dose, um, or, or just, you know, dose dependent toxicity effects. Um, I'm sure at some point, I mean, if anything like, you know, water can be toxic at, at a dose and, but within all practical means, there doesn't appear to be any toxic, you know, effects, um, that were identified. And then if you look at the exposure in the diet, you know, for animals and for humans, we've been consuming astaxanthin through salmon and crustaceans uh, and other sources for thousands of years. Um, and it's been on the market in supplement form for more than two decades. Um, and so not to say that that makes it safe, but with all that time, with the hundred or so clinical studies that have been done, uh, since it's been on the market, there've been no findings of clinical significance that have been noted. Um, the only thing that I wouldn't classify as a safety uh, side effect, but just as an effect that can happen is because acetaminophen is a highly pigmented, 
um, molecule, I mean, it is a pigment, um, you know, if you don't fully absorb it, it can color or discolor your stool. And so like, if you were to consume a, a bunch of beets, uh, you may find, you know, stool discoloration. So that's something that can happen. It's not necessarily the norm, especially if it's well absorbed, if you take it with a meal, if you have a highly bioavailable form like ours. Um, but that is, that is a finding that can happen. Um, but for the most part, you know, that's, um, I think that's, that's a win if that's the only thing, right? And, and so, um, if anything, when you look at salmon, um, it's, you know, it's conducive to giving them their beautiful pink or red coloration. But if you were to take away astaxanthin from the salmon, they not only would be gray, but they would be smaller and weaker and they would be less, um, you know, prone to being able to swim upstream and reproduce and, and more prone to infections. And, and so it really would have a, a negative consequence, you know, uh, it'd be a detriment you know, to, to the health if, if they didn't have it versus, you know, uh, it having some negative effects. Um, so, um, yes, I mean, those are really, if you look at the, the, the talk studies, the human exposure, the human clinical studies, um, I think it's, it's been proven quite well to be, um, to be extremely safe. With that said, you know, for anyone that is looking to start astaxanthin or any supplement or any medication, you know, everyone should always consult their healthcare professional, their doctor, because everyone has a unique situation, depending on what else they're taking. And, um, you know, you'll still, if you were, for example, taking medications, you'd want to, you know, monitor those and, and look at, um, you know, how things are going and, and maybe, you know, uh, doses of other medications or supplements would want to be adjusted depending on, um, you know, how you're doing with astaxanthin or other lifestyle or dietary or supplementation types of interventions. So there's always that caveat, um, but I think that you can feel confident to give an exceptional safety profile that you're working with, uh, with, uh, with astaxanthin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I, if I had to give it a rating, I'd give it an A triple plus rating from a safety <laughs> perspective, knowing yeah. all of that information in terms of the difficulty to even like find an LD50 or like determine toxicity. It definitely sounds like a, a really safe and, and it sort of sounds like a supplement that once someone starts, they might as well continue taking for years and years and years to build up into their body, to saturate their tissues, to permeate lipids and things like that to just provide the, the whole body a, like a really potent antioxidant protective effect. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm actually really curious, Dave, in terms of this might be an interesting question for you. I, I'm curious to know if there was to like be a study that were to be repeated that you'd love mm -hmm. to see, you know, because there's so many different incredible studies on astaxanthin. Is there one in particular that you would love to see redone maybe with a bigger population size or a big different demographic i'm curious yeah there's so it, there's so many different things like if you go to pubmed and you look at astaxanthin and fill in the blank different areas there's so many areas that are especially interesting and so you could look at things related to its mechanism and how it works in cells or you could look at you know health applications like you know more things related to um you know exercise performance or cognitive function or the longevity research. I think one thing that uh, wouldn't necessarily be repeating, but it'd kind of be building on prior research is that with the ITP, uh, where they demonstrate the lifespan increase, um, they also do work looking at health span uh, benefits. And while we all already have uh, amazing data related to health span, if you will, with respect to uh, heart health and joint and muscle health and brain health and skin health and eye health and all these things um, in various um, discrete studies, their program is so robust with, you know, the number of, um, of mice in their program and, and the way that it's designed and conducted that looking at um, benefits related to various aspects of health span, you know, regarding, you know, heart or brain, et cetera, beyond just how long the animals live as a, you know, measurement of longevity um, would be, I think, really exciting to further elucidate. And that is something that they can and hopefully will do in the future. But I think that will just add to the understanding of how it benefits um, these areas of health, not just over a study period where, you know, if we're doing a, a human clinical study, it might be 12 weeks of dosing. Or if you're doing an animal study, again, it might be, you know, eight or 12 weeks or even, you know, half a year or it could be a year. But, um, but in this, it's several years in this model, which for the uh, the mice that they're used, that's their lifetime. So you're essentially getting a lifetime's worth of data looking at various aspects of, of health that 
would I think really contribute to further under, understanding uh, Aston Sampson's potential benefits. Mm. What about in terms of, I mean, this is going to be an exciting area because I, I might as well share this with my listeners because I haven't actually publicly mentioned what I used to do and why I even used to take Aston's Anthem in the first place. And just for those listening in, there's going to be a long form YouTube video, which I'm going to explore in greater detail. But um, so the reason why I first came, why I was first interested in Aston's Anthem was because I was looking for different supplements like ergogenic aids that could support my um, athletic performance and also um, stamina on the soccer field. And I remember, you know, reading up about astaxanthin in different, you know, clinical trials and different like sports magazines like back in the day. And I was like, you know what, I might give this a shot. So I basically went to my local health food store and I grabbed a bottle of astaxanthin and I was combining it with the this fish oil that my dad gave me at a very young age. I was like, I was like 16 years old. And um, I remember when I first started supplementing with the astaxanthin, the most noticeable effect that I felt subjectively was that I felt like I could um, catch my breath quicker when I was at soccer training. So we used to do like big sprinting sessions at training and I just felt like I could easily catch my breath and I had a really good ability at just like recovering between bouts so subjectively i was like i'm completely sold like this is a remarkable antioxidant big doses of vitamin c don't have that sort of effect on me like it just it doesn't compare i was using a little bit of creatine at the time as well and some other like uh, ergogenic aids better alanine um but astaxanthin really stood out from an aerobic both anaerobic and uh, aerobic performance benefits so what I want to do now, Dave, is now that I've, you know, it's many, many years later, I'm on a podcast with a world leading expert on mm-hmm. astaxanthin. Um, talk us through what the literature says from an athletic performance perspective. Like, what what is astaxanthin doing? How is it yielding these positive effects on athletic performance? Yeah. So I think, first of all, we can start with the evidence that we see in nature, which is with salmon, um, who are both doing the anaerobic and aerobic bouts as they're swimming upstream. So you have the endurance factor of that long journey upstream, which is super strenuous, um, as they're basically wasting away to swim upstream to ultimately reproduce. But then they also have those sections where they're actually like swimming up the little falls and and trying to jump up, you know, um, the river. Uh, kind of against the the direction of the waterfall and that would be a very intense anaerobic exertion or sprint uh, or jump or whatever you would call that to to make it through and so they have this combination of anaerobic bursts and aerobic you know durations that um, demonstrate that with astaxanthin you know they are you know kind of getting through this and and ultimately able to reproduce Um, and so that's kind of an interesting example in nature um, that w- where we see astaxanthin in, in full effect. Um, and then if you look at um, in practice with like, like in your case, um, athletes were um, experimenting with this and finding benefits. And so whether it was uh, young soccer players or it was triathletes, and there was a lot of different use cases uh, for it. And, um, you know, if you look at our testimonials, um, there are various people um, that uh, report. Um, and let me pull up here. I had, I had looked at a couple. This person wrote um, noticeable endurance boost and joint relief. I've been consistently taking X3 for about three months now, and I can without a doubt say that it uh, has noticeable effects on both my endurance throughout the day as well as recovery periods from intense workouts. Um, another person says I'm an endurance athlete, and upon taking X3, I've noticed how good it felt. You know, it's like my brain woke up and I was sleeping better, recovering faster, and so. Things like this uh, are are definitely you know common. So it's not just limited to, to you know your experience and 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 uh, but this, definitely this is something that others have seen. And then um, scientifically, if you look at the clinical studies with astaxanthin and exercise performance, um, it, it'll depend. There there will be some studies where uh, it'll show um, a benefit. Other studies studies where it may show uh, no statistically significant benefit, which um, is potentially um, you know uh, confusing because you wonder well is it working is it not working but what you have to also think about is okay 
what type of study was designed, how many people were in it, were there enough people, was the design of the study sufficiently uh, put together to actually demonstrate the benefit you were looking for. And so that, that's something that can be very challenging when you're looking um, at that, that type of research, especially when these are preliminary studies with the small groups. Um, so there is some of that where depending on what study you look at, you may find some benefits or not. But I think it's been proven in the real world with actual applications. Um, and then mechanistically, um, if, if you look at things like um, if you, for aerobic activity and for endurance, if you are um, you know, burning uh, the fats and you have long chain fatty acids that are uh, being converted into uh, ATP by mitochondria, the, the pathways by which that process occurs where the fat is broken down into energy that those pathways can become oxidized. And there's been research showing that astaxanthin can help to mitigate that oxidation uh, of those pathways um, and therefore allow the mitochondria to uh, more effectively produce energy. Um, and so that therefore your endurance could be better. Um, and there's um, related um, you know, science showing that astaxanthin can have an impact on um, mitogenesis or you know the, the creation of additional mitochondria um, and also just specifically on ATP production you know both young and older uh, subjects uh, in, in, in canines for example um, and so if, if you can have impacts on the number and the size of the mitochondria and if you can have impacts on mitophagy or autophagy or cleanup you know within the mitochondria uh, if you can reduce the um, oxidative stress, um, in the membranes of the mitochondria. These can all have benefits on the, um, the efficient production of, of energy in the mitochondria, which can have impact on athletics. And then from a recovery standpoint, you think about all the damage that you're doing to, to your muscles and, and your respiratory system. And if you can have something on board that is a, a powerful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, that can help with that recovery. Whereas others may be, you know, uh, icing and taking over-the-counter anti-inflammatories and things like that, you can potentially get benefits along those lines with, with astaxanthin as well. Um, so with all that said, uh, going back to your earlier point about additional research, it would be great to do much more research specifically on exercise performance with astaxanthin to really elucidate exactly mechanistically uh, how you're getting the benefits um, and to flesh out use cases with larger um, sample sizes of, of individuals to really get a better understanding of exactly you know the benefits but i think it's definitely been proven aerobic and anaerobic benefits there's also been studies showing uh, in older individuals improvements in muscle size and strength um, and so um, you know, that's a, another related benefit obviously um, you know that would have impacts on on, on various uh, athletic pursuits um, so, so whether you look at, you know, you know, strength, uh, and muscle size, whether you look at endurance, um, at, you know, or you look at recovery, um, I think you, you'll find a lot of interesting insights there that, that support its use, uh, for, for various athletic uh, purposes. Yeah. And in terms of the, um, a lot of the dosages that we use in those like cycling performance studies, were they sort of hovering around that four to 12 milligram, uh, dosage range? That's the other thing. You'll see a lot of studies have been done with yeah, doses in, in those ranges, 4, 8, 12, um, yeah, perhaps sometimes higher. Um, but for the most part, they've been in, in those types of dose ranges that are the equivalent of one capsule or a couple capsules um, of typically the microalgae-based form of the astaxanthin. And so what we've shown, though, in um, both in animal studies, but also in our human uh, work is that higher doses are typically correlated with um, better um, results. Um, so you can have dose dependent reductions in various you know, markers or improvements in various um, um, you know, aspects that you're looking to measure. And, and so uh, given a safety profile, exploring higher doses is, is always exciting scientifically. There's practical reasons why a higher dose may not be something you want to take because the number of capsules or the cost. Uh, but if you're just looking at absolute performance or, or health benefits, um, looking at higher doses uh, can definitely be uh, interesting. And I think that that research is, um, should be furthered. Um, and now that we have products like ours on the market that are much more bioavailable, 
um, we actually did a, a head to head human study with our form of astaxanthin versus a um, leading microalgal astaxanthin product. And we took a group of human volunteers, uh, healthy individuals, and gave them a dose. We actually did two 12 milligram capsules as the dose of so 24 milligrams, uh, just to make sure there was a nice amount in there to get good measurements and then measured their blood at multiple time points over the course of 24 hours. Um, and this is actually the study where we determined the half-life as well as the maximum concentration times. And so we did that with the group, measured their blood over the course of a day uh, for astaxanthin levels. And then we had them washed out for a week without any astaxanthin supplementation or consuming any foods with astaxanthin, and then gave them our form of the product, again, two 12 milligram capsules, did the same thing, measured their blood at multiple time points. And it turns out that we had uh, the, the maximum concentration, which if I recall, I think was at maybe nine hours post-dosing, um, was three times higher in, in our group um, versus the other. And this was the same group of people just one week apart, the same individuals taking um, the, the two different doses of uh, the two different products. And so we had three times the blood levels um, at a maximum concentration. But also if you took the total exposure, the, the total area under the curve of all the exposure over the course, course of 24 hours, that was also three times uh, difference um, So from, from the same dose. And so if you're looking at some of the other clinical studies that have been done, those often have been done at relatively lower doses, like you said, it, you know, it could be four, six, eight, 12 milligrams. And so now if you think about, okay, well, what if higher doses potentially could be better and you potentially have a, a version like ours that's more bioavailable, you know, the, the results can be very different depending on, um, you know, the, the dose. And, and so I think that's an area where additional research and individual use cases, um, you know, can, can really help to further understand uh, benefits you may get at different doses, but also beyond just different doses, it can come down to different blood levels, you know, and, and so not everyone absorbs everything the same. And so while there's not a consumer uh, accessible blood tests for astaxanthin at this time. That is something in the future that we think would be cool to bring out because we, we have methods that we utilize for our research, um, but those are not uh, accessible to consumers, you know, cost effectively. Um, and so, but at some point, if we can make that available, then people could actually map what result they're getting. Like say in your case, oh, I'm finding that I'm, I'm able to recover faster after, you know, certain sprints or exercise or whatever it may be. And, oh, this is actually the blood level that I have. And then you can try to dose to a blood level and, you know, and see if that is something that other individuals could also benefit from. So, so that's a way that we think in the future could be interesting to, to really go about it. Yeah, no, definitely. And what about in terms of, I guess, like the skin protection effect? I remember back in the day when I was supplementing with astaxanthin, I definitely went through a phase where I no longer needed to use sunscreen and because I just... I literally couldn't get sunburn. Now, this is not medical advice for those listening in, but I, I, I literally did not get burnt by the Australian sun. And the Australian sun is like harsh, like really, really harsh. So maybe do you want to talk a little bit about that, Dave, in terms of its natural UV protective properties? So this really goes back to astaxanthin's initial purpose, you know, with, with how nature uh, developed it. You know, the microalgae were being exposed to the sunlight and the damaging effects of the UV light. And so this co-evolved with the algae as a tool for them to survive and not have, um, you know, endure damage from the sun to, to their DNA, you know, et, uh, et cetera. Um, and so this has then been consumed up through the food chain and provided all these benefits. And so same thing in our case, it can help with our skin health to do the exact same thing in terms of protecting against the damage from the UV light. Um, with that said, uh, like you said, we can't give medical advice, but it, at least in the US, the, the FDA considers sunscreen or sunblock to be a drug. Um, and so you can't actually make the claim that this is like a natural sunscreen or sunblock. Um, but there is, of course, great science uh, showing that it, it does, um, you know, support skin health. And so this is something that, say, in combination, you know, with sunscreen or sunblock, of course, would be the, the, the best approach. Um, but there's, there's no doubt, there's no question that, that astaxanthin does help people um, with, with their skin, looking at whether it's 
wrinkles or moisture content or elasticity. Um, and this is both from oral ingestion, but also some people have looked at topical applications of astaxanthin. Um, but um, but even you know orally, um, how our product or most products are on the market with astaxanthin, you're going to get a skin health benefit and thereby uh, mitigating some of the effects of the UV light uh, that would otherwise potentially be damaging the DNA, um, you know, in, in your skin cells, et cetera. And so um, there's definitely an important skin benefit, which of course is important for aging um aesthetics and, and all these reasons and so um it, it's it's basically going back to the the core principles of, of why acesanthin was developed and how it protected the algae and we can benefit in the same way hmm. amazing amazing what about in terms of uh i guess we looked at you know we've covered many different aspects many different benefits um in terms of like cardiovascular health curious to know what sort of research has been done in that area, like how maybe astaxanthin can impact nitric oxide production or um, mm -hmm. helping with, you know, blood flow, things like that. So sort of, yeah, run us through the research from a cardiovascular health perspective. Cardiovascular is probably the area that's had the most research, I would say, both in animals and humans. Um, and so we, for example, have done a human clinical study in subjects that have cardiovascular risk factors or a history of heart disease that were on cardiovascular medications like blood pressure medications or, or statins. And these were generally unhealthy individuals that didn't have great lifestyles or diets. Um, and we wanted to see if astaxanthin, if, you know, if our form could, could help them. And they also had elevated inflammation as measured by HSCRP, and which is also people think about lipids or cholesterol being involved in, uh, in heart health, but inflammation also plays a major role. So we wanted to see, uh, you know, knowing astaxanthin's impact on inflammation, we thought, okay, if we can find individuals that have elevated inflammation that also have cardiovascular uh, health issues, could we, could we help them? And what we showed, and this is just after 12 weeks of dosing, that we had statistically significant reductions in LDL cholesterol, in oxidized LDL, in blood pressure, um, and also, if we looked at a, a, a subgroup of people that had diabetes within that study population, we had um, reductions in triglycerides um, and HSCRP uh, inflammation. Uh, and this was actually not a large uh, study. It was intended to be over 100 sub subjects, uh, but we started it back in 2018-19 uh, timeframe um, in terms of the design work in 2019 with the, with the dosing. Um, and then we ran into COVID and so we had to cut the study short, but even based on our, um, initial, um, you know, review of the first 40 subjects, uh, because, because of the benefits, we actually were able to see statistically significant benefits in those areas that I mentioned. And it kind of goes back to our dosing discussion where we had, and this was a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial. We had a, a control group and then we had a low dose and a high dose, um, and the low dose was the equivalent of two capsules a day, 24 milligrams. And then the high dose was the equivalent of eight capsules or 96 milligrams a day. And we actually had the improved benefits at the 96 um, and no uh, side effects or, or issues there as well. Um, we also allowed individuals um, to carry on open label, um, thereby knowing that they were on taking the actual product at the end of the study period um, through a year, but because of, of COVID, they actually were able to extend longer than that uh, as the study was somewhat um, on hold. And um, again, you know, showed, um, you know, continued um, good safety and tolerance and uh, tolerability, um, you know, with that uh, longer open label uh, extension period. So, so there was work like, like that program or that study. Uh, there's been many other human studies showing um, similar benefits in terms of reductions of uh, cholesterol and, and um, you know, other aspects of, you know, increased NO, uh, blood flow improvements, we've seen all of that. And then in the animal research uh, space, and this goes back to our pharmaceutical development days, there was a lot of interesting science that we and others conducted. And so um, our, our initial studies were looking at um, is ischemic reperfusion injury, where if you cut off blood flow to the heart tissue um, and then restore it, the, when the blood flow is restored to the tissue and it's reoxygenated, it can actually cause a lot of damage to the heart tissue. Um, and we showed across multiple species 
um, rodents, um, rabbits, canines that we reduced um, the, the damage, um, the ischemic injury to the tissue and had that myocardial salvage um, improvement. Um, so that was um, you know, our initial work. And then we, we extended from there into looking at blood clots. Um, and we saw that both um, secondary occlusion or rethrombosis, because if, you, if someone has a clot um, and then you go in and get rid of the clot, the conditions that cause the clot to happen are still there. And so it's very prone to reocluding. So that secondary or that rethrombosis is very likely. And we showed that that was, um, was mitigated, that was reduced um, in, a, in a model. We also showed that primary thrombosis, um, the initial onset, the time to occlusion of an artery um, was prolongated. Um, so you're less prone to occluding the artery. We also showed that if you look at plaque buildup, um, in the arteries uh, of the heart, um, you could actually image it and look at control versus low and high doses and see that um, visually with the imaging that you reduce the, the plaque buildup in the arteries. Um, so we had all of that research as well. And so these are all pharmaceutical applications. You know, for a supplement, you can't claim to be treating these things, but this is just the research that's out there that's publicly available. Um, and so it just shows that uh, astaxanthin does have uh, some really um, exciting benefits. And, and so if it were to be developed as, as a uh, pharmaceutical, these are types of things you could potentially uh, develop and try to get a labeled indication for. But from a supplement standpoint, it just supports the overall heart health benefits that this is, this is good for your heart. Um, and um, another aspect I'll mention is that it's important to look at the dosing and how that potentially could translate to humans. And so some of these studies um, that we did um, we, we typically would look at blood levels, tissue levels of, uh, of astaxanthin. And in our human studies with astaxanthin, we've also done, measured blood levels. Um, and so we can have a um, somewhat of a, of a sense of, okay, well, you know, this dose in the animals would somewhat translate to this type of dose in humans. And, and so for a lot of the studies where you had some of these um, more pronounced effects on, on heart health, for example, it, uh, our best judgment would, would be that that may translate to something more like that eight capsule, 96 milligram type of dose that we did as the high dose in our cardiovascular study. Um, but something like a basic uh, daily health longevity type of use case where say in the, the NIH funded interventions testing program study, um, the blood levels that were found with astaxanthin in a pilot study that they did prior to the main study, because they, they weren't able to measure blood levels throughout the main study, but they did it in a pilot looking at what those blood levels were, those tracked to somewhere in that one to two capsule range, 12 to 24 milligram capsule range um, based on our clinical work. And so that kind of gives you some of the parameters for one to two capsules a day, probably gives you that basic health and longevity benefit that potentially you know, you know, would support that longer lifespan. And then the, the higher doses as, as you work up, uh, certainly in, with the guidance of a doctor, you know, a healthcare professional would potentially be where you could potentially have um, you know, improved benefits for particular use cases that you're really trying to address a, a particular uh, issue. Um, so that gives some framework to um, real world applications of the dosing based on the science that's out there. Because sometimes it's like, oh, this product, this nutrient, this agent has this benefit, but how do you know what, how, how to actually achieve that you know, in your case with, with dosing? So. Yeah, remarkable. I'll try and leave um, some of the some of the research studies that you've sort of hinted towards in the in the podcast show notes, and also for the long form YouTube video that I'm that I'm working on. Um, that's going to provide some pretty interesting and refreshing insights to some of these uh, some of these studies. And a lot of these studies are, you know, I'm, I'm collecting them from the last like two years. It's just so great to see like such. We're we're talking about like these are new clinical studies that have been done. Uh, evaluating efficacy not only for cardiovascular health but also like you said you know cholesterol management things like that which is just unreal like to see a, a, a you know naturally occurring molecule astaxanthin eliciting such broad spectrum effects in human subjects mm -hmm. uh it really is phenomenal uh dave mm -hmm. what about in terms of this was going to be like more of an interesting question is around how does astaxanthin impact the microbiome is there any particular research indicating that it increases the growth of certain beneficial bacteria what what sort of research do we have in that in that area 
there's some early hints there, uh, some preliminary research um, that show improvements um, in, in the microbiome. Um, and so I think it's the same thing where um, if you're, um, you know, reducing oxidative stress and, and things, you know, in, um, you know, in, in the lining of the gut, for example, it's going to be more conducive to healthy uh, microbiome environment. Um, and so there, there certainly has not been extensive research in the space, um, but the, what I have seen when, I, when I've uh, looked into it is that it does seem to be supportive of that. Um, but yeah, I certainly wouldn't be able to speak really definitively about it just because there hasn't been a ton of research in that space. But I think it is definitely related. Just the fact that acidentin is so systemically distributed and incorporated into you know, tissues that acidentin will be um, in that environment. And you know, it's kind of all the same thing. If, you, if you're dealing with the effects of oxidative stress in one environment or another, it's going to manifest itself into different issues. But if you can address that, it's going to have a positive environment. So I, I think, generally speaking, it helps to maintain homeostasis or normal cellular normal functioning of uh, you know of the body in, in the various locations where it's localized. Um, so I sort of certainly think that that is conducive to a, to a healthy microbiome. Mm. Well, I know what I'll be doing after this is I'll be setting PubMed. Uh, notifications. Yeah. There's a few. There's a few papers. Yeah, so you can take a look at those, and I think that um, that would be. You should include that in your video as well. Just a look at the the early research in that space. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, um, in terms of any final final words you might have to say about astaxanthin, I mean, you've done like an incredible job at explaining things from like both a scientific perspective and also incorporating your own practical like hands-on experience like that's one thing that i i really respect about what you've done what you've built at ax3 life um you know you're very hands-on you've been in the space for over 20 years yourself so um is there anything else you wanted to hint towards or or mention to my audience if they want to um i guess like start they want to try astaxanthin themselves what sort of um um advice or information can you pass on yeah, so a few things. I, I think that astaxanthin is definitely something that virtually everyone could hopefully benefit from. And so I wouldn't think of it as, oh, I'm going to take it for this particular use case. You know, I, I want to, you know, improve this one thing. It has, you know, so many potential benefits that it, it should be thought of as a foundational health longevity type of supplement. So if you're taking a multivitamin or a fish oil or probiotic, you know, this should be right along there with those as a foundational uh, component of your regimen. Um, so I, I think it should be thought of in that way. And then you can start at a given dose, whether it's two capsules a day, one capsule a day, once a day, twice a day. You, you can you know, start somewhere um, that is suitable for you. And then give yourself one, two, three months to see how you're doing. And you can subjectively see how you're feeling How's my energy? How's my endurance? How's my recovery? How's my sleep? Um, you know, how are my joints feeling? How is my muscle feeling? How's my cognitive uh, function? Um, you know, focus, uh, memory. Uh, there's been clinical studies, you know, for example, in, in those uh, areas. Um, so you, you can take a look at those types of things. Then you can also look at biomarkers. And so if you get blood work done, whether it's the routine blood work that you go in to your uh, doctors uh, or lab for, or if you're doing any of the other more advanced services that have more comprehensive biomarker testing. Um, you can look at some of the basics like lipids and inflammation and liver enzymes and all these things. Um, and you can look at, you know, maybe areas that you're hoping to improve or maintain and, and see if you're having impacts there. Um, and then you can adjust your dose and, and then you see again after another one, two, three months, you know, how that goes and, and you can find dial in that optimal dose. Um, and along the way, just want to reiterate that because astaxanthin is fat soluble, it's best taken with a meal containing some healthy fats. Um, those could be avocados, nuts, olive oil, et cetera. Uh, just some fat content promotes absorption. And so while our formulation makes the astaxanthin water dispersible, which makes it easily to be dispersed into the gut as you're absorbing it, you still you're still delivering a fat soluble molecule that 
is best absorbed into the body along with other fats because then your body is in the process of processing those fats and acetaminophen can go along with them. Um, so I think taking it with a meal, either once or twice a day, a meal that has fats, and then paying attention to how you're feeling in all those aspects subjectively, but also objectively measuring uh, things, um, biomarkers, uh, or maybe um, aspects of performance or recovery, you know, other things, and try to, to look at those and, and then uh, adjust as, as you will. So I think those are important aspects to, to consider uh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I'm a big fan of um, just doing objective blood testing just to sort of analyze the any sort of intervention. And it's probably something that I'll um, recommend to sort of my older demographic clients if they want to do blood testing before and after like six months and have a look at how it affects mm -hmm. like CRP, how it affects, you know, potentially like cholesterol levels, uh, homocysteine, things like that. So that's definitely going to be uh, interesting and I'm a big, big, uh, big proponent of um, routine blood work. So, mm -hmm. well, I want, might, um, for those listening in, if anyone does want to look into AX3 Life, the link will be in the podcast show notes and please do keep a lookout both also on my website and also my YouTube channel. There'll be more content coverage, you know, going over the research around astaxanthin. Um, but overall, Dave, you've done such a, an amazing job at, you know, presenting on such a such an interesting topic. And I know my audience is going to have, you know, really enjoyed the episode. So I just wanted to say a massive thanks for appearing on the podcast. And um, I look forward to, to being in touch with you in the future. Thank you so much. It's been great to be here. And I really hope that we can just help everyone kind of be their best selves longer and, and live the lives that they want with this as, as a foundation. So thanks again. Look forward to more content with you. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. And for those listening in, uh, don't forget to leave a five-star review if you did learn something new on this particular podcast. And please do share it around so we get more listens and downloads. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I'm your host, Lucas Owen. I'll see you guys in the next episode.